and welcome Scott here to the podium. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for bringing me all the way out here to South Texas. Um, I think uh, Ginger Lynn was a part of getting me out here, so I know she couldn't be with us today, but I uh, appreciate y'all being here. So uh, before we get started, a little bit it's kind of about me and my pedigree. Uh, I spent uh, 10 years at the Hank Johnson School of Law in Birmingham, learning from Hank. Uh, and you'll notice there's two books up there. Uh, back in 2016, uh, I was out watching a number of our juniors play, playing with members out of the golf course. I'm like, we suck at playing the game of golf. As you all know, we weren't good at playing the game. So we ran a six-week class, uh, just kind of taking them through some stuff, and presenting principles that the champions play with on the left side there. Uh, and so we ran them through that, uh, through the course of that program, and we ran it for, we did a follow-up program after that for six more weeks, so over the course of three months, the average student improvement over that was three and a quarter shots. So that was all strategy. They weren't allowed to take lessons during that period of time, like all strategy uh, information. So uh, we were doing a presentation to the Alabama Northwest Florida section at the time. Um, Hank and I were there together, and Hank said, one day Scott's going to turn this into a book. So I hated English. I avoided every writing class uh, possible through college. Uh, so here I am. I've written two books and uh, host of a podcast uh, and based in Franklin, Tennessee. So that was uh, back from 2010 to 2020. So that was the first book there in 2019. And then Out Came Golf Decoded uh, in 2022 after tracking uh, over 10,000 holes of data on the PGA Tour uh, in 2021. So what I'm going to present to you is something that uh, you were the first as a group to hear this. Uh, I consult for a number of universities uh, with some back-end data like this, where we take everything through a strategic lens. So our entire team uh, that we teach with uh, at Franklin Ridge is to look first through a strategic lens. So we default to swing, we default to who was it that does the nine hole assessment first? I think that's fantastic. So you kind of get a nice view right out of the gate uh, at looking through a strategy lens. How many of you are familiar with Scott Fawcett and Decade? Fawcett's impressive. Any of your students use Decade? Anybody here? A little bit. So uh, there's a lot that we align with, but I'm going to take a different perspective than that. So you've heard professionals talk about playing from angles, correct? I'm actually going to measure those angles, and they actually have a data value to them. So we're going to look at that on three data points. So uh, I thought I had some fun with the title of the talk, the problem with strokes game shake things up a little bit. Okay, so that's the big popular thing right now. I want you to see that used appropriately is great. Used inappropriately, you actually may keep your players where they're at. You may not be able to see what's really going on, which back to that nine hole assessment I think is fantastic. So uh, here we go. So a few objectives. So uh, so a wise mentor of mine told me this, he said if you try to say everything about anything, you'll end up saying nothing. So there's a lot to this. Uh, there's a lot of details. You'll notice the book in front of you there, Golf Decoded. The first like half of that, even though it's short, it's very meaty, and then it's like, come and see me and I'll explain it to you. Okay? So it's actually pretty, pretty quick and simple. I'm going to do a little demonstration at the end, hopefully out here on the potty green, so you can actually see what this looks like. So uh, we're going to go through a quick overview of what game theory is. Like Golf is a game, so we need to view it through the lens of game. So, Football, basketball is about to start up. Everybody views we should run this play versus this defense and that offense, etc. So we view those things mostly through a strategic lens. We don't typically view golf primarily, first and foremost, through a strategic lens. We're going to go through that first. So new age stats: BPN, OPN, POA. Not to be confused with POAM. Uh, so measuring you against the course. What is strokes gained a measure of? Anybody? You against whom? You against everybody else. It's not just strictly a measure of you against the golf course. This is actually a measure of you against the golf course, first and foremost. Uh, best practices at the very end. How we kind of go about doing this. So this is where you're going to see some overlap with Fawcett. Those that know, those that know Fawcett, we're going to look at play with your average shot, right? So like, don't just play with your best shot. Yes, you get your eight iron, 150 yards one time. But what do you do with it all the time? So keep an open mind. Morning, this goes against some norms that you're used to here. So this is new data, and it's three data points. That's all you need. And after two rounds, we can predict what's going to happen with very high degree of accuracy at the end of the golf tournament. Should PGA Tour players, which they do, 
uh, follow that same type of behavior for the next two rounds. So yes, if you're wondering, if you made any money betting, yes, we made a few hundred bucks on the back end. You never bet a whole lot of money when you first tested something, okay? Bad idea, all right? All right, game theory brief overview. Uh, simultaneous versus sequential games. So golf is primarily, at least with stroke play, a simultaneous game. All the players play at the same time, and your decisions are not based on the other decisions of the people that you're playing with. Uh, even though there's three of them in your group or two of them in your group, there's a hundred of them playing at a time, right? So what you do doesn't determine what I should do, although that's how a lot of our students play, right? Like, well, they made three birdies in the first six holes, and I haven't made anything. So then they start to change their strategy. You shouldn't do that. That's you comparing against the other player rather than against the golf course. So basic simultaneous games are rock, paper, scissors. You have no idea what the other person is going to throw. Yes, you know there's three options, but you don't know what's happening if you have it at the same time. So golf is a simultaneous game most of the time. So a sequential game is when you play, then I play, right? So one of the things that needs to be looked at uh, without more detail is you'll notice the Ryder Cup record, right? Recent Ryder Cup. Back in 83, we were, it's like 22 and 3 Ryder Cup. Level of player, level of ability of players in 1983 out of Europe has rose substantially. We are 20, what is it now? 14 and 6 and 11 of the last, uh, yeah, 14 and 6 right now is the last since 83 that Europe has won. Who do they grow up playing a whole lot more of? A lot of match play. Match play is both a, uh, a simultaneous, but it's a lot of sequential game. That is part of the reason why I think, without going into more detail and more study, why we struggle in Ryder Cup, okay? So it's not just figuring out, obviously, it's, do we pair the right people together against the right people, there's all of that, but we need to look at the same different games. So sequential game, where you move, I move, you move, I move, okay? Now as a part of that, we also need to look at dominant strategies versus mixed strategies. So a dominant strategy is like the classic, like, play your game, right? Like, whatever your game is. If you're somebody who doesn't hit it very far, you're just going to be the person who hits it straight, has a great short game, and has a lot of precision, right? So you might be a bombing gouge type player, and that's fine. You need to play your strategy, whatever that dominant strategy is. So what should someone's dominant strategy be? That takes a lot of time to figure out, and takes lots of lessons, and takes lots of being around the right environment. A mixed strategy as well, it's just golf, right? So you've got a different lie, you can hit it high, you can hit it low, you can hit it left, you can hit it right, uh, you can curve it, you can flight it. So there's lots of different scenarios. You can play it left, right, so there's lots of different things going on. The reason why these are important when you look at dominant versus mixed strategies is how do we try to refine what's going on and simplify the decision-making process. So let me do this before I keep going here. So. Um, one of my favorite books is called The Five Elements of Effective Thinking. Uh, it was recommended by a mentor of mine who kind of got me started uh, writing and into that first book. And he said this, instead of asking people at the end, what questions do you have? Start with, I want everybody to write down two questions before we get to the end of this. So as we're going, please write down a couple of questions. I'm happy to answer them. Uh, so measuring strategic ability. You cannot measure strategic ability until you measure intent. Right, so we've all been in the debate with students. I mean, you've debated with your students over stats. Like, if you haven't, then you haven't spent enough time with the stats. Like, well, I did this because of this. Like, I didn't hit enough greens because I didn't hit enough fairways. Like, that may be true, but it may not be true. Uh, what do you say to one of my players who missed every single fairway and shot eight at a par? If you're playing from the correct angle, you may be able to do that. So, um, traditional stats tell us what, but not why. We can kind of dig a little deeper and get a little bit of why. Uh, strokes gained is a measure against others, primarily, outside of, uh, outside of ice and systems, maybe too complex, no context. It's like, just hit it to the middle of the green. Like, it's good general advice, it's great. Depends on the right, play to the left, off the tee. Great, but that doesn't get us down all the way deep enough. So, and here's the big kicker, and this is where it's gonna be a lot of fun, especially if you have done some college coaching, you do some high school coaching, is the ability for your players to adjust in real time to affect real change. This to me has been the most powerful tool. Uh, I'll share some stories uh, later, some of the work I've done with some of the universities. Imagine if you're a college coach and you can stand on the sixth hole and know exactly where you stand mathematically, and you don't have to go watch them play the entire time. You just stand in one spot and go, we're gonna adjust this, this, and this. 
or these two pieces or that one piece or just stay where you're at for the next six holes. You can spend your time wisely where you need to. All right. Golf deep cut at BPN with the info. Traditional thoughts get us close. Get it on the right, get to the left, side of the fairway, play the ball on the green. Proximity trumps all. That's actually how I got to trying to track this. So decided to test it. So I'm sitting there going with a bunch of students one year. I was like, you know, you just gotta hit it closer. Like we gotta find different ways to hit it closer. Maybe hit it farther, maybe you gotta wedge it closer, maybe you gotta be better with your proximity of your irons, maybe a shot selection, you're not playing enough for the wind, elevation, etc. Right? So there's maybe a number of things there. And then I had tracked uh, Brooks Kepka in one of the major championships when the pin was on the right, you hit it to the left. So I was like, you know, I kind of tracked that like a year and a half ago and just kind of put it aside. Now sometimes we'll pick up things we had done a while back and we forget to do them in teaching. Like, I forgot about that drill. Well, so I decided to go back and test it, but I went back with some revisions to it. Uh, measure all points from the first attempt at the green. Everything hinges on this. If you don't get this, you won't get it, okay? And your players won't get it. So it's all about intent. When you measure intent, you begin to measure strategy. Now I may get the question like, well, how do you measure intent of a tour player? Well, kind of pretty obvious in a lot of cases, right? So you can kind of tell when they're gone from par fives and two. Uh, now that you're able to actually go back and like see the shot that was hit, uh, that's one of the ways we do it. So if you get some of the questionable ones of like, they're in the right rough and they hit a ball and it's like only went like 25 yards, which doesn't happen very often, but it does happen. You're like, wow, uh, am I going to measure that? It's like you try to go for the green or not, so then you got to go back and look at the video and try to assess that to the best of your ability. Mm -hmm. Is there some margin of error in there? Yeah, but not very much. So instead of playing from the fairway, you can play from anywhere over there. You don't have to fit in the fairway. My, my data knows nothing about the ball being in the fairway, in the rough, in a bunker, uh, that's none of that. So instead of edge of the green, the nearest edge, edge is defined as a significant slope. We'll get into what that means and how much. Instead of center of the green, anywhere over there. So you don't even have to hit the green. My data doesn't have to hit the green, the fairway, and the rough, not in the rough, okay? But well, that doesn't make any sense. This is where I get the pushback, okay? So hang with me. So the stats, here's what they are. Proximity on first attempt. So let's say I'm 175 yards out from the middle of the fairway, and I decide to try to hit the green. Proximity in feet to the hole after the player's first attempt at hitting to the green. So let's say I go for it, slice it right of the green, I'm 30 yards from the flag, that's 90 feet. So that's what goes into the day. So it's 90 feet. Let's say uh, I've hit it into the right rough, trees are in my way, I kick it out to the fairway, and then I play on and I hit it to 15 feet. That's 15 feet, all right? So that's when that's measured. OP stands for opposite the pin. This is where, as we've done over time, I would probably go back and relabel that, but it comes from the traditional stat. If the pin is on the right, you play to the left, so it's opposite of where the pin is. Does that make sense? So, uh, location of the ball that is hit relative to the center line of the fairway in the first attempt, so it's where that ball from 175 yards is, okay? So, or it's where that ball that was kicked out from, so you can actually miss the OP off the tee. If you don't have a shot at the green, you decide to kick it out, you can kick it into the OP and that has a certain value point and then play up from there. So then I mark it from that one, not from the first one. So it's that ball, everything's measured from that ball that decides to go to the green. Okay. BPN, ball pin nearest edge. Finishing position of the ball once the attempt is made at the green. We're going to go through what is the BPN. Okay, so it stands for ball pin gear set, right? That's the classic. Try right, to do this here. Everybody see that? All right. That's the classic, right? Pins here. You want to have, right? You want your ball to finish. Ball pin near set to the green. That's the way it was traditionally taught. And kind of anywhere, kind of in this general area, probably pretty good, right? But instead of saying near set to the green, we're going to go with the nearest edge. Okay. Right. Proximity on the first attempt in detail. So I already kind of talked about the par five and two versus punch out between trees. One of my favorites is to see an attempt at the green from underneath the trees, and it rattles in the tree and it stops at 135 yards. So that's 405 feet that goes into your boat. Okay. That's how that's measured. So we're measuring intent, not based on how close that you get that ball from there. 
So proximity on first attempt. Remember, everything is measured based on intent. You know, when teachers say that over and over again, makes it something important to keep in mind. All right, opposite the bin in detail. How to draw it. Right, OP line is drawn from the center of the fairway at the means three. It runs parallel to the fairway at that point, continues straight forever and forever. Right? Now the reason why it's going to look like this, let's say I have a green that's like this, and the fairway that comes out and shapes this way to the right. Okay? So where this meets, so we can agree that that's pretty straight there, that's pretty straight there. That line's going to get drawn out right here. It's going to continue on forever, forever, and forever. The reason why it does not track and follow the fairway is that everything is measured relative to the slope on the green, not based on the shape of the hole. So the slope on the green determines everything. That's the new edge. Right? The BPN is going to be a pretty big important thing that we're going to look at. So wherever the BPN points, and we'll get to what that is and where it points, is where the OP is. So once I show you the line for the BPN, wherever it points, where the OP is. So if the BPN is right, then the OP is going to be right. If the BPN is left, the OP is going to be left. Okay. So, and when we hit it, when we put it in the data, I'll show you some quick views of data. Uh, it's pretty simple. I just put in a value of 0, 1, hit or miss. And that's how you can run a regression analysis and figure out the values of data points. We spent a lot of hours late into the evening pulling data off the BJ Twitter app and website. So a traditional view, if you like that, just run straight down the middle of the fairway. Anybody guess what hole that is? Let me take a crack and see it up close. Your bonus points to do. It's kind of like these lines anyway, that, you know, makes jokes real points of that. So traditionally we draw that's the first hole at uh, Firestone. Right. Here's some other examples. These are all here too. So that line goes all the way through. Another one. Now it's a little trickier, right? Because there's no fairway that meets the green. See that? You kind of follow some basic lines of logic there. <coughs> Same there. So that's how those lines are drawn. See why I want you to come see me to be able to detail some of these out. It gives you some funky scenarios like this. A lot of them won't be why is exaggerated as the two on the right? A lot of the golf courses that two players are going to play are going to be like the one on the left, or like just the demonstrator up here. All right, BPN. Nearest edge should be the edge of the green or any slope of the green exceeding two and a half degrees, roughly three degrees. So if you're, if you're using plot view or uh, swing view or some programs like that that actually have the heat maps on there, basically when it turns kind of yellow, reddish, orange, like once you see that color shift, that's usually going to be that that spot that's significant. So, BPM line is drawn perpendicular to the location of the nearest edge. It goes on forever. So, if we redraw the one I just had, right, the flag's here, and then the whole shape's this way, right? So, if we just go the closest edge to this, if we go traditional, right? So, traditional is the nearest edge of the green. If we do this, I would just draw a perpendicular line to that. It anywhere over there, and that has a numeric value. To it. Okay. You can hit it anywhere on that side. Now, this is where it gets tricky, so I'm going to draw a similar one. This is from our first hole at uh, our golf course. Any questions on that one? Pretty simple, straightforward. This is where it gets tricky. So, we have a green that's very similar to that, looks like this, similar hole location, which we would put that spot here, right? Similar shape to the pair. Right? However, there's a tier and a slope right there. This is now the new nearest edge. Okay, that's the closest of the edge. The edge of the green can count as an edge, and a significant slope can count as an edge. So now we draw a perpendicular line to that. This is where we put what in the world. Once you start to do it, it will make total sense to you. Alright? So I want you to hit it long left back left flat. When you start to play our golf course there, you'll see why you're going to do it. Okay. So long left, that is hit in the BPA. So simply by adding a slope in there, it changes the best location for that ball to be. 
they get the question of like, what if I'm not good at chipping from there? We need to figure that out. Or how do we figure out how to get more of your average shot without having the average shot thing? How do we get more of your average shot up into here without taking the risk of whatever? There could be a hazard here. My data doesn't know about hazard and penalty strokes either. He knows about you play, how you play your average shot over time. Right. Hey, Kurt, just for it. So, um, yeah. what does BGN stand for? So, it stands for ball and then the nearest to Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, that's great. Awesome. So, now, one quick question. So, yep. basically, I got the first couple of your actions. Kind of short side yourself, but now there's a slope there. That's the new short side is on the right. And that's correct. Right. Okay, that's correct. So one of my junior golfers I had test this. His quotes on the back of his book. Uh, he went. So when the junior club champion yeah. wins at their club, wherever he's at, he's up in the northeast. He gets to set the hole locations for the tournament. So he knew this stuff, and their guys that are plus three handicapped are shooting like 77. I'm like, how do we shoot? All right, what? Like. But he understood this and was able to kind of maneuver some things around and make the golf course play a lot harder. So, uh, and it's measure when hit anywhere on the opposing side of the line. It does not need to be on the green to count as hit. You need to hit in the water. So when I see a tour player, and let's say there's water over here in this scenario, let's say there's a hazard here, and he hits his shot going through the green and goes in this hazard. I've measured the distance of that ball to the hole. Right now he's got a drop and all that. It's like, welcome to the PGA Tour app. It'll tell me to the inch how far that ball is from here to the hole. It's like, in left water, 37 feet, four inches to the hole. It's like, great, I can track this data. This is fantastic. So, uh, edges at equal, di oh, this is, okay, I need to show you all this. Again. All right. Edges at equal distances from the hole intersect to form a pie slice shape. This is why Augusta National is so stinking difficult. Okay? Uh, and it's really hard to collect the data on that one too because it's like, how tight do we draw the lines? Right? So if I have a, we'll take a green like this. Actually, let's do this. Grab the book. Uh, go to page, I think it's 11. Right? I'll give you a visual example there. Is it 11? Yeah, it's 11. Great. This isn't going to be exactly the same, but I'm going to try and draw certain features of similar. Right? So, we've got the flag here. Let's go, the flag is there. Let's see, this is and this, not a perfect drawing, are the same distance from the deal. So, if I draw this line this way, it's on this side. Right? And if I draw this one over here, it goes parallel to that one, it's this side. Now I get asked the question, well, why not here? Well, this is this edge here is nearer than this one. Right, so you're not going to choose this side because that's also in some ways a nearest edge, even if it's farther than these two. So this is now your BPN right here. Pretty small. Now here's where this becomes super powerful for a student. They know this while they're playing. They're like, man, this is actually a fairly difficult hole location. It may look simple like it's front of the green, right? It's not that big of a deal. It's actually a very difficult hole location, mathematically speaking. So then you starting to manage expectations, manage risk. There's a whole lot of things you're able to measure. So back to viewing everything through the lens of strategy first. You can take care of some of the mindset and mental stuff and focus stuff if they can understand some of this stuff. Right. Here's some examples for you. These are actually all the same hole, just some hypothetical hole location scenarios. Alright? So, you can all see that over here. Alright? So, hole location's here, nearest edge would be there. Right? Pretty obvious. Especially if you have a hole location sheet in a yardage book like this, with heat maps on it, you can figure it out pretty quick. So it's straight line, miss left. So I want you to miss left of a left pin. That's fun. Now it's a little more traditional, right? We have that white dot up here on the left. So if I get it there on that side, I can go anywhere to the right of it. Now, if we go back, look where that whole location is. That whole location is three yards of the line flips. Of whole location data and the PJ Tour, and I can draw those lines and pull the data. It takes a 
better to have two or three people pulling data than one person pulling data. It takes a long time to pull data. Again, similar hole location, it moves a couple of yards back. Now this is where it gets tricky, okay? So, should be able to see this pretty well. That white dot is closer to this edge of the green than it is to that edge of the green, correct? Can y'all see that? Why is that line drawn in there? That's correct, because there's a slope on the back, right? So that's now another edge, and those are the same. They're equidistant from there to there. So now that closes off that back point. So you just try to keep it in that cone? That's correct, keep it in that cone. So this is a BPN that points left, that's a BPN that points right. That would also mean the OP, when we look at the fairway, needs to be left. This is the OP, it looks right. Now here's where it's a lot of fun. When you actually go do this demonstration with students on the golf course, any of y'all ever stood over shot in the fairway, like, man, this just feels uncomfortable like, from over here. If you shift to the other side, if you move to the correct side, into the OP, you will feel differently over the shot. You can hit whatever shot you want to hit. So our brains are processing 10 million bits of information every second, nine million of them are visual. So if you read all the great golf course architecture books, they love toying with our eyes, right? So when they toy with your eyes, that makes sense. Now we can kind of have a tool to go against our lovely architects. And then there's this one. This one's fun. But I don't want to hit it in the water. I agree, right? That has a certain value. None of my data points are worth one shot. They're all less than a shot. Right? What's the value of hitting it in a hazard? A one shot, okay? But now we can talk about how do we get slows in your shot pattern to actually maneuver the ball closer to the hole. So we've done, this one's a lot of fun in a class to look at. It's like, hey, I want you to fire at that flag. You want me to what? Yeah, I want you to hit it right at that flag. This is why I don't like aggressive or, you know, conservative shot selection. Like, it's actually a very conservative shot selection to draw. So if we take, if we take the shape of that green to be roughly like that, and then we make that slope a rough drawing here. Look something like that. And we take a dispersion pattern that looks like that. Right? Those that are over here are going to stay over here. Agreed? Right? On that shot pattern. Right, so all of these are going to be over here. But all of these, selected right, are going to be here. And the ones that land in the slope all move back. So you can actually cut somebody's dispersion pattern down pretty tight. You can actually understand the level of difficulty of the situation you're in. It's actually not that part of the whole location based on your shot pattern, how far you are away, etc. Right? But it also helps you manage risk. Which are you willing to take on where you're still in the Obviously, not an easy hole location by normal standards and by comfort of the play and the way the ball is played. All right, where it came from. So PJ Tour app, um, golf week was my best friend. I said it a puppy slope book every week, so I didn't have to go and buy it. It was awesome. Uh, US Open is the only one I've never collected data on because it's, they never post the article. And they never post data. Tours never post the data for the US Open. So I have no data for the US Open. So don't ask me about the US Open. Because I don't have any data. So basic multiple regression calculator in Excel. Okay? Anybody know what a p-value is in stats? Okay, that's good. So p-value is basically a measure of fit of the slope. Okay? So something that's statistically significant in stats would be a p-value, we're looking for something less than 0 0.05, which is, put another way, if that slope or that line is a 95% fit. Now we have three data points plus their score on the hole, so that's effectively, you have three dependent variables, one independent variable. So what happens in that category, I can't draw you a picture of it. Although I do have a 3D mock-up like box of kind of what it might look like. It was in 3D, that's just me being a nerd for one day and just trying to see if I can create a model for it. So it's basically it fits in a 95% model. So really strong p values are less than uh, 0.01. So TrackMan and Foresight also when they're pulling data and they're collecting data, 
they're trying to see how accurate is the actual ball flight to what it happens. So they have, before they produce it all, right, their P values are super tight in order for us to be able to measure it. Otherwise, they wouldn't produce it. It would be like, this thing's wrong all the time, right? So it has to be a super, super tight P value. P value for this is less than 0.0001. It's a 99.999% value. We're sitting there, three of us, that help, the two guys that helped me collect the data, I looked at all of it, they put it all in. We're like, this can't be true. This cannot possibly be true. So then what do you do? Like any good person do, you can test it. So then we collect data for the next couple of tournaments. I'm like, no. I didn't design this to project. I designed it more of like as a reflection over the course of three or four rounds. Can I look at like where maybe some of our errors were in strategy? That's kind of how I designed it. I was like, what if we just take the first two rounds and make a projection for the next two? And the amount of accuracy in that is phenomenal. So then we started throwing you know, 20 bucks on that bet after two rounds. One of my favorite ones would uh, we're looking at it in Vegas had Morikawa at like third or fifth. And I was like, Morikawa's a lock mathematically, nobody can touch it. So I was like, I had a lady in one of my classes that I was first presenting this information. She put down like a hundred dollars on Morikawa. I made I don't remember how much she made, she made several hundred dollars. She's like, This is great. I was like, don't you come to me every weekend and ask ask me and tell you that. So Right, and it doesn't include any of this stuff. Fairways, greens, pots, penalty shots, distance of approach shots, driving distance, etc. <laughs> That's the wild part. Right, so think of it as basically we're playing the billiards now. There's certain things in the way. So that's like, what about the rough? It just tells us that angles matter a ton, but it's not angles in terms of the shape of the hole, it's angles relative to the slope that's sitting on the green and where the flag is in relation to. So, this is my fun part. So, we have proximity on the first attempt. We have OP. We have BPS. We've got three data points to be able to predict the scores. Crazy. Uh, wait till we do that. So, uh, so proximity on first attempt. So if you think about it, nothing has a value of one. It's between zero and one. It could be positive or negative. So the further away you get it from the hole, you should have a positive value, right? So this will be a positive value, right? Does that make sense? Every foot you get it further away, okay? OP would be if you get it in the correct angle, that would produce what kind of number, theoretically? Produce, produce a negative one, right? So with this, if you hit it in the correct location, that should help your score go under, not over. Follow me there? All right, who wants to take a crack at giving me a value? So if you said like 0 0.1 for, you know, hitting it a foot closer, like that would mean you'd improve by a tenth of a shot on the average. But I'm not looking for any one moment in time looking over the average of the round that is played. Okay. You want to take a crack at any of these values? Which one do you think has the highest value? In terms of the most effect on your score. You got three options. Somebody can take one. Alright, so you think this is the, this is first. Yep. Anybody can take a different crack. So playing from the correct angle into the green is the most important. So what do you think is anybody want to the near edge? You think the near edge is number one? Sound like a lot. 
but it's under quad rate. That would make sense if I hit it over here, it gives me a better angle in. The other thing, this is why all the data points can fit together, all right? Every time you hit the OP, your percentage chance of hitting the BPM goes up. You're more likely to hit it in that location. Better bet, you ready for this one? This is where I'm playing around, this is per foot. That's all each foot closer is actually worth. That's it. Even if you go to a golf course, I'll talk about how certain golf courses, the formula can change a little bit, but it's still statistically significant. Like an extreme example would be TPC Craig Ranch, where they shoot like 2,400 par every time they play there, right? So this only goes to point zero zero uh, like six seven. Or sorry, it goes down four four seven. It goes down to point zero zero four seven. So it's like uh, it still doesn't do much. Each foot you hit it closer. The location matters more. It's like so you're telling me it's better to hit it to in the BPN than to hit it twelve feet on the wrong side. Yes. On the whole, not on the one time it's played. Right? Would it be better in a playoff to be 10 feet from the hole instead of 30 feet on the correct side? Probably. But if you play this 72 times, this is going to win. So people ask me, oh, Finau's going to win, right? How many times has Finau been like, playing great after two rounds? My data says, like, there's a couple of them, I'll show you one. Uh, where it says like, hey, he's at 10 under through two rounds. And my data says on projected would finish at 10 under. I'm like, nah, that can't be right. There's no way it's gonna be right. And shoot like two under, two over, and shoot 10 under. I'm like, yeah, be kidding. Like we're creatures of habit, and it's repeatable, right? It's the average shot scenario. So we call it. So Finau doesn't hit more than like 10 or 11 BPNs at a time. You cannot win a PJ Tour event unless you hit 14, 13, 14, 14 and a half. Good luck in a PJ Tour event without fourteen of those on the right. So it's got kind of like John Rom has the highest BPN <coughs> average, or Corey Mack. Scheffler is really high on BPN. Okay. okay. What, what is Which it? is why he can get away with strokes getting caught being on hundred forty four. Right. Okay. So guess who had a tighter proximity? Uh, Cameron Smith or uh, or Scotty at the at the Masters coming down the stretch. My data actually had Cameron winning, but I was looking behind it because he was so tight on proximity. He was under 500 feet almost every single round, which is really freaking good. If you're under 600 feet, you're playing great. Like under 500 feet is phenomenal. So we're looking at that, but his BPN value was less than 10. Scotty's was 13 and a half, with one of his rounds being super high. Now, Scotty in one round, the third round, dropped his POA under 500, made a bunch of birdies, and then, but he was able, and so he dropped his BPNs by like two or three. So like, the closer you get it, the harder it is to hit your BPN, especially at Augusta, okay? So that's where we're able to see that, and hitting that mark trumps a lot, especially the harder the golf course gets. Y'all can read that over there. This is the kid I was telling you about. It's on the back of the book, Harrison. Calculated that over the last seven rounds, he's hit approximately 70 BPNs. And on those 70 holes where he hit the BPN, he's only six over par. Made 17 birdies. That's kind of following the text thread there. That's 17 birdies. And on the holes I didn't hit the BPN, which is about 56 holes, I'm 29 over par. Think about that for a junior golfer. Trying to get in college. And hitting the BPN as being anywhere in that area. Anywhere over there. With the exception of being in the hazard? Doesn't matter. My data doesn't know if you're in the hazard or not. I'm going to show you an example of a swarm. Right. <laughs> That's why I'm like, this can't be true, right? But you keep doing it, you go and consult for some universities, you have some fun. All right. Case study Carson Stoller. I kind of made a slight aside of like, well, what if, you know, you have to hit the fairway? What's the benefit of hitting in the rough sometimes? What's the ball do, what's the ball do different? Or it spins what? It's less, yeah. right? It also takes off side spin, right? So if you're somebody who's got the ball wild that day, it can be helpful. So Carson was struggling at the end of this tournament. He's like, 
Scott and I are going to try to fix it. I'm just going to go ahead and just, we're going to stay with the strategy. I'm going to commit to the strategy in this weak right ball. I'm just going to hit it with the OP on every hole. I'm just trying to hit the OP on every hole. So uh, both days, he played the front nine, missed every fairway on the front nine both days. Hit more fairways on the back nine, but missed every fairway on the, on the front nine both days. Shot 500, 300 on the, on the front nine. Missing every single fairway. Some of the curves of all, like Bubba Watts, would he be more preferable to be in the rough more often than the fairway? It would depend. Bubba likes to curve it, right? It's also one of the reasons why I look at why does Bubba play well at Augusta. It's a lot of slopes, moving, right. playing for money and lies. Like, you've got to be able to shape the ball and maneuver it a whole lot. And there's not much rough out there. So, whether he should or shouldn't play from that would be bad enough. Just he could be in the OP. A lot more often. That I would mean that you know, he has done. Now the other one about Carson that's been a lot of fun is Carson's gone like, all right, instead of me just being I'm out of position, we tell people to take their medicine, right? It's like, well, what does that mean? Like if I if I hit it, if we take a hole like this, let's say the green's here, so the pin's there, so that would be a left VPN, right? Let's say the fairway is make this quick and simple, it's like this. If he hits his tee ball over here and makes an attempt at the green, he's missed the OP. Right? So he's not in it because the OP is on this side. That's the fairway shot, right? The OP is anywhere to the left of the center line. Right? So he's missed it. So if he makes an attempt at the green, we know his proximity is going to go up. It's going to get worse. And it's going to be harder for him to hit the end from there. Okay? What if there's a whole bunch of trees right here and he doesn't have the option? People go like, oh, I'm just going to kick it out. If you just kick it out, like, you still miss the OP. So now he's learned how to kick it into the OP. The number of times he saved par by kicking it into the OP and then going for it, because when you hit the OP, you know your proximity goes down and it's more likely for you to hit the VPN. So, yeah, sure, you've lost a shot, right? You've added a shot to your score by having to kick out. But if he hits the OP, and he hits the VPN, he's regained how much of a shot? It's actually, it's exactly uh, 0.35 shots. All right, so if he has to kick out three times, there's a good chance if he kicks out into the, into the LP, he's going to pick up at least one of those three lost shots. Because he's regaining, putting himself back in position. So it's not just about kicking it out, it's about kicking it into the location that then allows you to have a chance to I had another girl do this in the tournament. She's like, I got a shot at the green from there, but she didn't think she could get it close to, she actually just won a state championship in Missouri. Uh, had a shot, she was trying to kick out, going for a flag similar, but she's like, I just don't think I can get it in the BPM from there. She had a clean look underneath the trees, like 120 yards, get a six iron, you can bump it up there. She's like, I opted to go here, get it in the OT, play it up safe mm -hmm. So She had both options, she could do both. She understood this because it would make a better decision. Case study, Gary Jones, Hillsdale College. Uh, I was with them at uh, last, yeah, last spring, mid-pines, uh, climbers. Uh, I was following the top three groups, uh, their top three players, just kind of tracking the data, seeing where they are. I missed like one or two holes of Gary. I said, Coach, I don't know exactly how many VPNs he's hit. But he's hit at least 14 by my book, but he shot 70 on the pace shoot 75. So I told Coach on 18T, I said, when you see Gary, because I can't talk to the players, right? I said, when you see Gary, to turn for that next 18, so 36 in one day. So when you see him, I said, just nudge proximity closer to make like three birdies in his first six holes. Made three birdies in his first five. Which had 67 on the second round. That's the adjusting in real time because there's an actual data value applied to those three data points. It's three. And you don't even have to like know the number. You don't have to be like, right, I'm currently like, you know, 1.2 over par from six holes. You don't need to see that. You just need to be able to see like, hey, I haven't hit very many VPNs. I've hit a number of OPs, so my proximity is good, but I haven't hit very many VPNs. If I keep this up, it's going to break. 
We'll see it in the data. We'll be collecting it. So I'll be reading off the data. It's super boring. You can have fun listening to it. Uh, sitting in the room, I'm like looking at the PJ tour app. I'm like, zero, zero, negative one, all right? And then it's like the first value is like 27, so that's the feet, and then zero, 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 37, zero, zero, zero. And like, if there's a bunch of zeros coming in, that means we've missed our marks, right? And the guy that's putting in the data, Taylor, he's like, there's a bogey coming. Where's the bogey at? Like he can see it coming. You don't have to see the ground coming, right? He can see it coming, and sure enough, there's usually a bogey. All right, let's see. Uh, <coughs> let's do this. Since y'all asked a little bit about like, what about hazards? Yes, it is. Right. 
So like, your brain's telling you something. Remember, it's processing 10 million bits of information every second. It'd just be nice if it would bring it to the conscious level periodically when we choose it to uh, in certain ways. So, uh, something to think about there. Sanderson Farm, short and speed. Oh man, 700, 400, 400, like he's a lot to win the golf tournament, right Scott? No, nope. sorry, it's not. At that point in the tournament, he had made two bogeys. And my data basically said he should have made six, right? So you, there's four bogeys to come, right? Now if we take that average to the fourth round, that means we basically should see one more bogey. Right. Guess how many bogeys made in the final round? Five. Made five of you supposed to make. <clears throat> Does the data smell about you? I hope not. Now, this then presents a problem. What happens if a player doesn't shoot their number? Then you know exactly where to look. So we'll go do this with some. So it'll put a projection after four rounds. Like, all right, you put your data in. It says you should have shot. 1.5 under party shot four over. I look at you go, where are the four and a half shots? That's where then you can use your strokes gain data, right? That's where you can use your data from clips. That's where you can use that kind of stuff to help you look for it. But it might just be a shot selection error. So most of the time, if somebody doesn't shoot their number, it's either a penalty shot or a short game. It's not a pro shot. We'll get to how you change your data. But if you don't change the data, like you hit 526 feet of power, 12 ppn, 11 up keys, how do you shoot your number? You shoot your number through short game and no penalties, which matches a lot of fault stuff, right? Avoiding three putts, bogeys on par fives, that kind of stuff, right? So it's short game and avoiding penalties. Now how do you improve your data? That's shot selection and maybe the swing side. So, go back. Any questions there? Let's see if I had any other. Hi, I had a highlight in red. Here we go. Here's your. So in my book, I call this pulling a fiend out, all right? It's on the far right. You don't want to pull a fiend out, sorry. Uh, but 900 through the first two rounds, my David says he should shoot 8.5 under par. Shoots nine, so it's even more even more in the final two rounds. Another favorite one, I had one in here, Patrick Green. I was, when I was first getting excited about my data, I was like, this is so exciting. And then like, Patrick Green, Hits a par five and two from like 35 feet, and like, I'm going, great, he's gonna make a birdie and beat my number by one or two. I was like, I do not want Patrick Reed to beat my number. Like, please, if anybody, don't beat my number. He three jacks at par's glass hole, shoots the number on the end. I like, <laughs> win. This is crazy, isn't it? It's crazy. This doesn't seem possible, does it? Seem okay. But when you start taking your students out there, it'll make total sense. Right? So think about this idea like drawable, stable, doesn't matter, throw them out. If you put it in the correct side, you can any shot you want. If you're in the OP, whatever your stock shot you like to hit is, you can hit it. If you're not in the OP, you feel forced to do something you can. It's not yours. And then if you decide to do what's your dominant strategy, then your proximity's not gonna be as tight for that, but then it'll be the end of this time. Right, so your score So here's the value. Alright, we're back to the y equals, alright, we can do this team. Alright, negative 1.8846. That's an arbitrary starting value. Now what I'm working on is data for colleges and for high school. So far the little bit that we've tracked is the only thing that changes, that starting value comes goes up a little bit, right? Goes towards the positive. But then the others, like the VPN value goes up to like 5.5. They miss the location, right? What types of shots are, you know, high school and college level players not very good at the short side of difficult shots, right? So that makes sense. So we don't have enough data yet, and it's hard to get all that data. So I'm kind of hoping we can eventually get there. But the point is, okay, so 28 cap where the cable goes low point. They're in the rough compared to it's still. I mean, yeah, that was my thought. Like, oh, so guess who I gave this to first? Better players, right? Right. And then I had a gentleman using 26 handicap. He did this, 
and to a 19. What can a 26 handicap do, right? Remember, what are we measuring? It's all about what? Starts with the letter I? Intent. Intent, okay? So he's going to look at me and go like, well, Scott, I got 180 yards. I can't hit it into that.
he was even worse at putting. Coach has been trying to convince him that they need to do more putting. So that's only four shots. So it's actually seven putt. It's work. Then, well, why, why the seven, right? Why did you putt so poorly? Let's think about your putts. Not enough line hit it too firm. Is it a higher line than softer? Or use aim pointer or whatever. So they debate you. This kid couldn't debate me anymore because I looked at him and I said, where are the, where are the eight? He's the one who found the seven. It's like, oh. Now it's him doing it, not the data telling him. Right? It's not, it's saying, well, the stroke is going to I thought it wasn't that bad. Like, yeah, it was. Right? But you, it's those three data points. Now you're discussing around those three data points. Like, okay, well, why did you chip it close? I, like, I had a guy, I'm going to show you Stephen Cherry here in a second. Oh, perfect. Good timing. Right? This is Stephen. All right, this is going to, like, freak you all out for a second. It's too much, too much data. Right? But, I'm working on an app, but you didn't you know, try to build an app, you know they're really expensive, right? So, one of his first rounds here, 1100 public. That's bad, okay? That's not very good. It's not very good. But he hit 12 VPNs, 13 OP, shot 9 over par. The data says, so we come up here to this side, right? So, this is the same date, 1228, 1228. Actual score was 9 over, said he should have shot. 2.7 over par. Wow. So I was like, all right, assuming that you have a good enough short game, like, okay, what is that? Or there are penalties. There were no penalties, all right? So it was short game related. So Stephen, where are the seven shots? He's like, well, I just didn't make any, you know, I didn't make any putts. I was like, all right, tell me about those putts you didn't make. Like, well, I had an eight footer after I missed the green on two. I had an eight footer after my chip. I was like, well, how far was your chip? 70 feet, dude. <clears throat> like, you should get that inside of eight feet. To get inside of five, like you're putting, you're saying it's your putty, so you're putting it's your putty, you're putting This went over and over and over for these holes. And so what's to the right of this, this is where it's gonna get kind of crazy. Is then, I had him go through, because we went through each one. Drive, don'ts instead of once, like I wanna do this, wedge it closer. And two yards left, now, that's a changing of the shot. Right? Shot selection, worked on the four questions out of order, didn't look at, like when you sit in a wedge shot, it's, I have a selection of shots to go through. You pick the number first, just hit the shot, right? and read the why first. So now we're actually getting down into why, All right? You see don'ts instead of once. Like, I don't want to hit there, 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 I don't want to hit there. Where do you want to hit? So now we're actually, okay, this is a lot of like focused mental work we need to do. And he was, I just kept asking questions like, all right, where were the lost shots? All right, one there, okay, tell me about it. That's more work on you, but you can charge and sit down and work through it. That's not a big deal. No luck with it. Now it gets crazier with Stephen. Because I used to have, where do you go? So I have to see, maybe it's not this far. Okay, it's not this far. But I had him do another one where it's change the data. So instead of going 1100, how do you get to 800? Now that changes the data. And so that's where things become interesting. Now here's an interesting graph. He kind of broke this down further. Using accounts and like numbers. Okay, now your students don't have to see this. Now that's freaky, so he simplified it. All right, this is over the course of, over the course of this year. All right, and this is what he shot, and this light blue line is his trend line. We haven't done much work on his motion. Now, we did a little work here on his motion, so you can see this score come up, right? And then went after it, and we just started working on his motion again, so you can see that score track up just a touch. But this is what he shot, right? That's the trend line of his scores that are dropping. This is the trend line of what he should shoot. So as a college program, you can look at that going, where are we trending as a team? Are we getting better or are we getting worse mathematically, strategically? Are we getting better or are we getting worse? Six minutes? 15. 15, sorry. It's like perfect. It's perfect. So you can actually follow trend lines. So the app I'm trying to get built is where, as 
a college coach, you can sit there and go, all right, I'm qualified and put their data in. All right, we're training in the wrong direction. What do we need to shift? We need to change BPMs, we need to change OPs, we need like Gary to change POA. Hey man, you fit every single BPM, but your proximity isn't that great. All right, nudge it closer, bud. But on, what are you nervous for? Hitting every mark, just nudge it closer. So you get some confidence in the start of this because it actually is attached to the score. You can't grab the strokes gained data on the PGA Tour. You cannot grab it and it go, all right, I need to have this much of these four strokes gained things and that's what's gonna get my score lower. This does every single time. You change this, you change your score, and you change your potential. And it's basically just shot selection, short gain, and don't have any penalties. Short gain and no penalties matches faucet. Fawcett and uh, Brody got us started down the right road. Now, this is an interesting one. We'll do this real quick. And I think we're going to finish. Let's see. I'm going to avoid the how we teach it. I'll be happy to. We do it in group classes and kind of let them kind of work through it and see if they understand it. Uh, but this is a young man. Um, Sue I Lynn played on the LPJ tour. I got to teach alongside her some. She has her own academy in Malaysia. She has a young man right now on the Asian Developmental Tour. And he's been tracking the data and sending it to me. And she's like, what do you see? I was like, I need like three or four rounds so I can see a pattern. And so I'm looking at it going, this kid's hitting like 15, 16 BPNs. I'm like, awesome. A couple of rounds, he's at 13. That's fine, that's great. So he's, But he's only shooting like one and two under. Okay, what's going on there? Let's ask some more questions. And I went back and looked at the data in more detail. When he misses the BPN, his proximity is really bad at the same time. If you've got to miss the BPN, you do not have bad proximity. That's a double-edged sword. Okay? So I looked at it, I was like, hey, you've got to watch that number. So worked on that. The next two rounds shot 66-65. Just try to avoid in those scenarios where he might miss the BPM being far from. You can't miss it and have high pull. So I mean, you can, but then your short game's got to be phenomenal. You can beat your number with short game. You can lose your number with short game. You can lose your number with penalty shots. shot thing, uh, 10 ball exercise, we're actually up on the green and ask them out of 10 shots, how many of them do you hit relatively straight? So I've got to attach their average shot to like getting in those spots. Like if they don't know what they actually do, then it's going to be hard for them to get it into that spot. Hence the uh, doing the club gapping so they know how they actually hit their clubs. Um, Robbie Fields at Jacksonville State, he's the women's coach there. They're two strokes lower this year, uh, this fall season. Um, and he does BPF, but he doesn't have his girls do it. He actually just puts them in there like, hey, we need to hit it here. So it's a different way of doing it. So it's like, you don't want your students to understand all the numbers, like, hey, we should hit it here. There's lots of different ways of doing it. But we do the average shot out of 10. How many hit relatively straight? Uh, four. Okay, then I toss them out. I'm going to go right, I'm going to go left. They go shorter or longer when they go those ways, toss them out. There's your 10 shot pattern. So as coaches, you can kind of have an idea of like, how wide that pattern actually is, they almost never debate you. Then we go back and we do shot selection, like the counting for wind, the lie, all of that. Then after I do this, making sure they understand what their average shot is, because it's better to be experiential. Don't just show them, like, it's great that we get those bubbles on TrackMan and GC Quad, but it's better if we actually take them out there and have all 10 of them. That's why I like a class size. You actually have everybody stands on the balls, like, all right, this is where your pattern is, it's this location. You want to improve your score. Whatever you do in one ball, you have to do the ball. Where would you move? All right, I'd go three yards right. So everybody picks up the ball, walks three yards right, and drops it. And then we have the piano on top. Uh, go. Uh, so, just kind of end here, and then I'd like to take us out here on this putting green real quick and show you all what to do. This is a great time for you to ask questions when you walk out there. Right. Play a few rounds yourself. Don't teach if you don't understand. Track it for a player or two without their knowledge. So like, go do a play and 
go do the nine holes assessment and just track the data yourself and then kind of show it to them on the back end. Uh, input the data, ask me for help, let me see it. I can give you the Excel form, unless you just haven't put it in there. Uh, Stan Sayers out of Colorado uh, in RSA recruiting. We've done four of these now for RSA recruiting for a university. Actually, bring them to us. We'll do two and a half days with you. We'll actually go through and play around. All right, we'll track the data. We'll look back on the end and help you learn how to review. All right. Items of importance. Get more out of the round. You can adjust on the fly. It is so much fun to be able to sit there for five holes and go, honey, I know exactly what I need to change. Like, I'm totally good. We hit it like dog crap and be like, okay, I know where I need to go. You don't want your players thinking about their golf swing when they play, right? By and large. It's a great way to do it. You don't want to see how, how the BPM is going on out here on the body cream. Yeah. Then come on out there and ask some questions. If you come out. So, is there a door we should go out? It doesn't matter. Say again? Does it matter which door we go out? No, sir. One of those. Right, one more time? Yeah. yeah. So,